Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, as you can tell by the title and what you're currently staring at, this is my DVD review of CM Punk Best in the World, and yes, before anyone says anything, this DVD does not hit the stores until this Tuesday. However, Kmart of all places, yes, Kmart, uh, decided to stock this DVD early, and I'm sure a lot of people like myself took advantage of that, ran to Kmart, and picked this thing up. Um, just, I was too, I'm impatient, I'll just say it that way, so I had to get this as fast as I can. Got it yesterday, watched it today, and I was just... I was blown away by this documentary, guys. It was fantastic. All right, let's get to the DVD before I get to my thoughts on this. Um, you guys see Punk right there. It says Best in the World 3 to set. You guys see Punk holding a WWE microphone. And uh, it's, a, it's a cool cover. I like it. People, you know, there's some people don't like it because it's, like, simple. But yet, like I said, it's simple yet effective. That's what I tell people when they say it's like, oh, it's a bland, generic cover. It's effective. It looks like a comic-like book because look at the background. Like, you can't even tell what the hell's in the background. <laughs> So that's what I, another thing I like about it. But, alright, on the side here you got a picture of CM Punk. CM Punk, best in the world, 3 to set. Got a picture of him right there. CM Punk, just looking pissed off the world. It's not just a DVD, it's a pipe bomb. 3 to set. Uh, it says right here, For the first time ever, experience the rise of CM Punk with CM Punk, best in the world. From his early days in the indie circuit to his explosive transformation into the, w into the most unabashed, outspoken champion in WWE history. This two-hour documentary traces the life of CM Punk through exclusive, never-before-seen footage. Fellow WWE superstars, close friends, and the voice of the voices himself give you the unprecedented access to his life in this revolutionary 3D set. Find out what CM really stands for, and why he's straight edge, and what inspires his blistering pipe bomb rants, and more. Uh, you got pictures of him closing Jericho at WrestleMania 28, infamous pipe bomb promo, and him doing the go to sleep. Right here, you got some more. Includes over four hours of career defining matches, hand selected by CM Punk himself, including action from his early days in OVW and ECW, his breakout Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 24, battles with the Straight Edge Society days, epic main event versus John Cena, Chris Jericho, and Daniel Bryan for the WWE Championship, plus in 30 extra 30 minutes of revealing interviews, stories, and more. It is rated TV-14 for language and violence, ladies and gentlemen, which you don't see on WWE DVDs that often these days. Oh, oh never mind. <laughs> it was looking weird because I was like, wow, that side looks higher than this one. Then I realized this is, you got a plan on this side and you got the, yeah. <laughs> on the, when you open it, uh, great artwork, I think, in my opinion. On this one, you got a picture of him from his pipe bomb. Pipe bomb, not pipe prom. Um... Day in and day out for almost six years, I have proven that to everybody in the world that I am the best on this microphone, in this ring, even on commentary. Nobody can touch me. CM Punk, June 27th, 2011. And you got Epic, If Punk Loses, We Riot in the background. That's a great thing. And this one I really like here. You got a picture of him when he first won the world title. And you got a picture of him now holding the WWE title. That's like a little transformation thing. I really like that. It says best in the world on the side. Open it up. Uh, you have the listings, and you got disc one, disc two, and disc three. And behind each disc, you have behind disc one, you have CM Punk, Money in the Bank, Chicago, seven seventeen eleven. All right, behind disc two, you have Over the Limit, Rolling five twenty twelve. And behind disc three. I popped out pretty easily. Got him. WrestleMania 28, Miami, 4 1 12. So it's pretty sick artwork behind the disc. And you have the listings here. Um, you have disc one. You have A New Day, Space Boy, Backyard Fame, uh, Taking It to the Road, Launching Pad, Constantly Learning, Dark Cloud, Not the Prototype, Outcasting Champion, Having Fun, A Challenge, Saving Society, uh, Frustrated Beyond Belief. Hometown high pressured situation, the man. And special features you have high school sports, CM Punk, the name, uh, Skull Fractured, OVW vs. Albright, uh, from Extra to Champion, December to Dismember, First Impression, In Ring Style, It's Clobbering Time, The Hat, The Most Insulting Thing You Could Say to Me, A Conversation with Lars, Title on the Fridge, Natalie's T shirt, and Teenage uh, uh, Arnick. Fuck, I can't pronounce the word. There's a, it's a song called that. But I, I can't pronounce it. You can pronounce it. I'm pretty dumb. So, 
Of course, you have the magic listing. I'm not going to list them or say them because they're in the description. So if you want to look at them, they're there. But here's a little glance at all the matches. As for this two and this for this three. Teenage Anarchist. There you go. Anarchist. There we go. How to sound it out because I'm pretty dumb. Alright, so it's inside the DVD of CM Punk Best in the World. Now my overall thoughts on this DVD are, it was, like I said, it was mind-blowing. Uh, honestly, I'm probably going to say this is my new favorite DVD. This was just, it was one of the best documentaries I've ever put out. It was simply phenomenal. No complaints from me about this DVD whatsoever. It was just very, very fun to sit through. Very inspiring, to say the least, the way, the stuff he went through and everything, and the things he said. And I honestly think when people watch this, people will say, like, oh, this guy is a dick in person, he's a douchebag, he's a prick. I honestly think people will have a brand new perspective on CM Punk after watching this, because this honestly put me into a new light of him. It honestly revealed stuff I never knew about him, and it was very interesting. Now, the way this documentary kicked off, I had an infamous quote for him, you know, it was like a, if you watch the main event, which I'm pretty sure a lot of people didn't, uh, they had a video package for CM Punk that, you know, the first thing you saw was, like, a bunch of the letters, like, their, the letters were quoting as he was talking. It started off like that, and it showed about a minute to a minute and a half montage of him, like, getting up in the morning and, like, stuff what he does. And then it kicks into the documentary. Uh, he talks about how, as a kid, he really wasn't close to his family. You know, he, his, he only had one brother, and he always says he has a sister. It's not legit, he... It's not like biology, ugh, physical, ugh, I can't talk, because this DVD's got me like so like amped up and excited when I watched it, it was so mind-blowing, and I'm so speechless, I can't even put in the words how like describing everything this was, so go see this for yourself, but uh, his sister Shailene, he claims her to be his sister, it's not biology, biolo see I can't pronounce it, biologically, there we go, there we go, uh, his real sister, it's like, you know, one of your friends, I say, hey, you know, you're my brother, you're my sister, it's like that. So he legit only has one brother that he actually hasn't spoken to in 12 years. Well, you'll find out why. And he has a mother and father. And um, at a young age, I think it was like 16. I'm pretty sure it wasn't 18 when he moved out. Uh, he moved out of his parents' house at a young age and moved into his best friend's house, you know. And, uh, you know, he moved on from there. He went to high school. He was... He pretty much, it looked like he lived like a poor life, basically, the way it was presented. He didn't, you know, have a, a lot of friends, you know, he, yeah, I made fun of him at school because the way he looked and talked and everything. He didn't, he didn't have, like, a very well life, you can basically say, but he made it through it. I like got to high school, like I said, he got picked on, no one really liked him. Uh, he actually started a backyard federation called the Lunatic Wrestling Federation. Yes, you heard me right, you heard me right, Lunatic Wrestling Federation, which him and his friends did. And it actually became like a legit company, like, not like a legit company, but they started drawing crowds, you know, 200 to 300 people, and it went up to 1,000, it was getting huge, and they became so huge, they actually took over, like, a local, like, uh, company, um, you know, because it became so huge, and they started making money, they started running venues, and Punk talks about how his brother, you know, was like a, a guy he worked with, you know, that handled the money, and one day, his brother just stole all the money and ran off. That's why he hasn't talked to him in 12 years, because of that incident. And, you know, Punk goes into talking about how he got into training with Ace Steel. And, you know, how he met Cobana. And when he met Cobana, they instantly clicked. You know, and they're completely opposite people, too. Cobana was like a football player. You know, he was big, and Punk was like this small guy. And you just, two guys you never think would click. They became best friends. And they became so popular to the point where, like, okay, um... They became so popular that every show they went to, they wanted to see CM Punk or Cole Cabana because they worked so well together. And Punk became the huge person in the Indies. He, he came really, really good, really, really quickly, too. And they talked about, you know, uh, AWA Mid-South was a huge thing in his career. That basically launched his career was that. And his matchup with Chris Hero was headlining everywhere. They were so crazy in the last match in uh, AWA Mid-South. It was the last show at a, I'm not sure if it was the last show ever or just at the arena or the venue, I should say, they're at. Him versus Chris Hero in a TLC match. They literally broke the house down. They were slamming each other through walls. They were trying to tilt the searing down. It was insane. It was awesome. And, you know, they talked about um, how 
he thought he was really good until he worked with Eddie Guerrero, and Eddie Guerrero basically put a new light on him, you know, saying, like, wow, like, he, Eddie Guerrero didn't say he sucked or anything, he's just Punk's, like, compared to this guy, I blow, basically, which led into Ring of Honor, how that company is supposed to be an elite group for, like, all the top guys in the indie circuit, which he went to, and he just clicked in and, you know, uh, fit in very, very well there, and he loved being there, and that his matches with Raven, the feud, you know, really, really put him on the map, and really made him infamous, not infamous, but famous, and his matches with Samoa Joe were just phenomenal, he said him and Joe, you know, Joe is one of the guys he said he can click with very, very well, just one of the few guys he can just instant chemistry with like that, and you know, it, he, t he talked about how he went to Gabe one day and said, I got to talk to you. And Gabe's like, you signed, didn't you? And Punk's like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they wanted the spill in the sheets that Punk signed. So in his last match at ROH, everyone thought he was going to lose and thought he was going to leave. But they actually used the internet to their advantage and swerved the fans where Punk won the ROH title and did the whole summer of Punk. And when he signed the WWE contract over, you know, the, the ROH world title, you know, that was just a surreal moment to see. And, you know, talking about his last match with Cabana, how he was just very emotional. He didn't even want to leave, you know. That's how emotional he got. He just didn't want to leave at that point. But he had to, you know, his last match. And him and Cabana worked a very fun match, he said, and he was proud of that. And then he went to move on talk about, I'm trying to make a video here, and you're sitting there interrupting me. That's not very nice. Anyways, as I was saying, then after that, he went to OVW, which he was not satisfied with at all. Uh, Paul Heyman. Uh, this is where the whole Paul Heyman guy comes into effect here. Uh, basically, Paul Heyman stood up for Punk every day, you know. Paul Heyman loved Punk because uh, Gabe Sapolsky, you know, him and pa Paul Heyman were, you know, like teacher and student, you know. And Paul Heyman, you know, said when Gabe told him that Punk was good, you know, Heyman believed him. Heyman really, really liked Punk. And WWE had no clue to do with him. They legitimately said that they signed Punk. They're, they had no intentions of calling him up, and they probably end up re were going to end up releasing him. And Heyman, you know, Heyman didn't fly with that. He didn't like the idea of that. And so, you know, Punk, you know, did well on OVW. Heyman was trying to get him called up, but no one wanted him to get called up. Then the ECW brand opened, and uh, they Heyman's like, this guy's coming with me when I go to ECW. When ECW happens, he's coming with me. He's my first draft pick. And Heyman specifically told him not to change his name, not to change his look or anything, because... He wanted CM Punk. CM Punk is him, you know, Phil Brooks. He didn't want anyone else. He didn't want someone else being called up. He wanted CM Punk to be CM Punk. Not CM Punk to be, like, freaking, I don't know, uh, Joseph Hallelulo or something. I don't know. He wanted CM Punk to be CM Punk. And that's what happened. Went to ECW. I was doing well there. Paul Heyman left at the end of 06. Uh, Punk thought he was screwed because Heyman is the only guy sticking up for him. So, you know, when Heyman left, Punk's like, all right, I'm screwed, I'm going to leave. And, you know, Punk got to the point where is this, he said he's just going to have fun because he thought he was going to get fired soon. They gave him the ECW World title. You know, he said his matches with Morrison weren't very good. All right. Okay. He says matches with Morrison on pay-per-view. He didn't like them because he felt they could have fit 20 minutes of time into a 20 minute, I don't know, let me rephrase that, he felt that they could have had like 15, 20 minute matches, but they had to fit all that into like a 5 minute match, so that's why he didn't like his matches very well, but the match he won the ECW title in against Morrison, he legitimately said that he felt that was one of his best matches ever, and that was a good match by the way, and when he became ECW champion, he thought that was going to be the biggest, you know, he ever got in his career, you know, because he had no reason else to be there, they didn't even like him, they wanted to get rid of him, but he just, he kept, he tried to prove them wrong every single time. And after he became ECW World Champion, they jumped into where he won Money in the Bank. And when he won, won Money in the Bank, you know, he figured he's going to be the first guy to cash in and lose. That's the way he figured it. But he actually cashed in, won the World Title, and he was just like, I'm the World Champion, you know. And when he became World Champion, he didn't like the way he was, you know, basically made out to be. They basically made out to be the guy, just just the guy that's holding the title. They didn't make him important or anything. They basically didn't care for him that he was a World Champion. They basically didn't even care for the world title when he was champion. And they basically told Punk, like, hey, you're having it just to have it, you know, until we figure out what to do with the world title. You're going to have it until we figure out something, which he didn't like very much. He didn't like the idea that he's just a guy holding the title, and that's what pissed him off. He said when he's a world champion, he should be one of the main guys, which which he wasn't, you know. <laughs> they didn't make him out to seem to be one of the top guys, and when he lost the world title and forgiven no weight, he said he got there, and he was excited to compete in the scramble match. You know, it was the first ever scramble match, and he was very excited. And right when he got there, they told him, hey, 
you're losing the title. You're not going to compete tonight. We need the title for HBK and Jericho. You know, their feud needs to be the world title feud. And he didn't even get the bill to compete. He just got kicked in the head and took the night off and left. So he didn't even lose the title. He basically got taken away from him. That's what he said. Like, they just took the title away from him like it was nothing. He talked about being tag champs with Kofi, then become Intercontinental Champion. You know, he was basically saying they're giving him all these things, and he didn't really know why they're giving him all these things because they didn't even want him. They didn't even like him. So he was kind of confused about that. But, you know, he took the ball and ran with it. And then he talked about running WrestleMania again, how he was shocked that they basically gave him another chance and gave him the briefcase again. And then when he cashed in against Jeff Hardy, won the world title, he's saying he's a two-time champion now that he deserves to basically be a top guy. And uh, and uh, when Vince Vince talked to him before, I think it was during World Champion, he said, Punk, I have a challenge for you. We want you to be heel. And Punk's like, what's the challenge? And Vince is like, to be a heel. And Punk's like, yeah, what's the challenge? Because, you know, Punk's a phenomenal heel. And, you know, Punk took offense that Vince didn't think he'd be a good heel. And Punk told him, like, hey, Vince, give me three months and I'll be your top heel. You know, and that's what happened. He went out and tried to become the best heel he could possibly be. And he put over his feud with Hardy pretty good. He said his feud with Hardy was just, they told stories, which we don't see very often anymore. And that's something that, you know, he was very proud of to be able to do with Jeff Hardy, is tell stories. And then after he lost the title, Jeff Hardy won it back again. He was excited, he thought he was going to roll as world champion. Then they tell him that he's going to feud with The Undertaker and lose the title, which that didn't fly with him either. And uh, Undertaker did not respect Punk until he stepped in the ring with him. That's when Undertaker respected Punk. And then, you know, uh, Punk mentioned that he didn't, it didn't make sense to him how you go from main eventing SummerSlam and then a couple of pay-per-views later, you're in the dark match against our truth Like, how do, how does that work? How do you go from main event to dark match? No problem like that. It didn't make sense to him. And that was another thing that he hated. You know, he wanted to leave. Then he started the whole straight edge society thing when he recruited Luke Gallows. And he said Luke Gallows was one guy he needed because Luke Gallows was huge. And they had the whole storyline where when he was Festus, he was on drugs. So that's why he wasn't acting normal. And Punk got him off the drugs, made him straight edge. And straight edge society, he got so much heat for this. People were calling him the devil. That's how much heat this guy got. He wanted to be the anti-Jesus, and he became the devil. People were calling him devil. They didn't like him. Everyone hated him. He was just a devilish heel. I did not realize how over as a heel he was in 2009, 2010, until they showed like house show footage and everything. This guy was such an evil heel. <laughs> it was like unbelievable how much, how over he was as a heel. And uh, he had fun, he said. He said, uh, uh, you just basically, that's, that's him, you know, being a heel. He loves being a heel. He loves pissing people off, he said. And uh, when he recruited Joey Mercury. Joey Mercury told a story that I was honestly shocked about. Joey Mercury mentioned how when he was a drug addict, that's why he got fired in 07 because he's a drug addict and he wouldn't basically give it up. Uh, his house was up for full foreclosure. And Punk, when he was world champion, he wasn't making that much money still. Punk bought his, Joey Mercury's house for over six digits. And bought Joey Mercury's house when he didn't wasn't making that much money. That shows how much or how good of a heart CM Punk has, in my opinion. But the whole straight edge thing, uh, you know, he said, you know, it's it ended, and then it basically just goes on to where he talks about how he became. Uh, we did the promo, you know, he came in, and they told Punk like, hey, you're gonna like the plans for today. And Punk's like, what? He's like, we're gonna give you a mic. You're gonna air your grievances. And Punk took a section that. He's like, all right. And when he, when he cut that promo, he said that all that in that promo was, you know, the six years of frustration he had in that company. And he just let it all out. And when he did, it was just everyone was flipping out and they were just impressed with him. And he was he was legit leaving. He said he was leaving. He had no intentions of resigning. And he said he had two uh, conversations with his, uh, Joy Mercury and I think it was his friend Lars. Uh, he had two uh with the conversation with that made him stay and he and Vin Punk and Vince were negotiating a deal during Money in the Bank during the pay-per-view they're negotiating a deal so Vince had no idea if Punk was going to lose or win until you know they signed during the show and you know he was demanding all his things and he won the world title and he said immediately when he won the world title he ran up left the arena got his car and drove home he legit went home <laughs> and uh he just, after that, you know, the promo and everything, that really launched his career. That made him to the guy that he, he thought he should have and could have been the entire time he was there. And now that he's there, he's basically looked upon as a team leader. You know, people look at him as a leader, and people always go to him for advice and everything, and he considers himself 
probably the top guy in the locker room because everyone's always asking for advice from him. And he says he's always busy now with media appearances. I had days off don't exist for him anymore because he's always working. And, you know, the DVD just ends with everyone basically, you know, saying how great of a guy he is, how much of a team leader he is, blah, 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 blah. But, uh, yeah, that's how it ends. Oh, they do a Ferris Bueller spoof at the end, too, at the very end after the credits. Uh, Punk's on bathrobe. He's like, what are you guys doing here? It's over. Go, go, it's over. <laughs> it was pretty funny. But this DVD overall, just fantastic. Definitely recommend it. Uh, my brand new favorite DVD. I'll just put it that way. It's inspiring, like I said. I think people will look at Punk a whole new way after watching this. Just spectacular. Can't wait for you guys to watch this. And that's my review. And uh, I'm out, guys. Thank you for watching this very, very long video. <laughs> Alright, guys. Thank you for watching. Very, very much appreciated.